Hello everybody and welcome to the Showcast, a series of candid conversations from the world of film, brought to you by the Film Verdict and hosted by yours truly, Matt Micucci. Today we're back on location at the 2024 AVP Summit in Reggio Calabria, Italy, to speak with Nicola De Angelis, CEO of the Italian production company Fabula Pictures, which we talk about, including its transition from development company to production company and some of the content it has produced and will produce in the near future. But De Angelis also shares his thoughts on the current landscape of the audiovisual industry at large and, importantly, we reflect on the role of co-productions and international co-productions, how they may soften the blow of some of the hardships endured within the field in the face of recent challenges, and how they may also help both producer and creativity flourish and projects become successful. So without further ado, fire up an audio teeny and listen to the audio waves as they fly through the air. This is the Showcast. Hello, Nicola. Welcome to the Showcast. Thank you. Thank you. From the AVP Summit. What a beautiful location, right? Do you often come around here, around these parts? Actually, this is, I'm a kind of a veteran because this is the third year I, in a row, I, I participate, I participate in, uh, to, to the summit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember the first time was in Matera. Second time was, um, uh, was, was, was in uh, Trieste and then, uh, Reggio Calabria. So I'm, I'm, I'm used to, Travel back to back and then go up and north from north to south. Yeah. And where are you originally from? Rome. Rome. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So, and I see you like tattoos like me. So, can yeah, you... yeah. I, I love it. What this have you is got? the last one. It smells like Teen Spirits. It's yes. a title from a Nirvana song. Nirvana. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I'm planning to do the remaining symbols of the cards because I love playing cards as well. Yeah. Um, you do? Yeah. A gambler? Uh, I've been in Vegas many times. <laughs> Is there any parallels between what you do in the audiovisual sector representing? It's gambling. It's gambling. Isn't it? And, and also this one, this is, um, oh no, sorry. This is um, Kenny from South Park. It's very <laughs> yeah. metaphorical for what, what I do. So it's like killing and uh, have new lives every, every, every episode. Kenny, for those who don't know, is the character who can't really, you can't really make out what he says. Yeah, and dies every, uh, at the end of every episode. <laughs> but, uh, but he's still alive in the, in the next episode. So it's like the life of a um, movie producer. Yeah. Who killed Kenny? That's right. Who That's right. Kenny? Well, you are representing, uh, Fabula Pictures. Yes. Why don't you tell us a little bit about Fabula Films? For those who are not familiar, what you do, what are the characteristic traits of the projects and the works that you kind of give birth to or help give birth to? Uh, We funded Fabula back in 2012. And it originally was a development company because I always trust the development first, content first. Um, Then we started to do production because development was too small for the size of uh, the company, for the size of um, our perspective and our... Ambitions. Ambitions, of course. Then we started with few movies, team movies at, uh, as, as well, and for Italian dramas, for Italian audience, uh, team, team movies were absolutely new and fresh. And then we switched into dramas, teen dramas especially, and teen drama, we, we made Baby uh, back in uh, 2017, and uh, from, from that moment, was, uh, that, that was our career. Gotcha, yeah. Any other examples that we can talk about? Oh, we can talk about the, the recent Briganti, which is, uh, the, this is Calabria is as the land of Briganti, outlaws uh, from the 19th century fighting for freedom from the power, from the big power of, um, the invaders from north. Yeah. From the north. Yeah. From yeah, the yeah, north. yeah. And now we're working on, um, comic book adaptations because we are so much into this world, I'm making a movie about the tiger mask, Luomo Tigre. No way. Yeah. You're talking about the character, the wrestler, you know, which one? The real life uh, person or the co- the comic book, I guess. The right? comic book. Comic book. Wow. Yeah. And the cartoon, the cartoon series. I Fantastic. mean, the anime series. Fantastic. And we're also adapting, um, probably this is going to be probably our next uh, teen drama. We will be adapting for platform for probably um, uh, Mila Shiro. Uh, yeah, so, yeah. That's a cult classic, right, in Italy. Yeah, in, it, this is the Italian title. I, I learned that it was very successful in France and uh, Spain as well. Yeah. Juan uh, and this, Juan and Juanita in, in, in Spain, I can remember. And Jean and Serge in uh, France. It's easy the name. <laughs> Yeah, it was this Cub- uh, volleyball players, volleyball, right? Yeah, volleyball, yeah. volleyball, teen drama. And Wonderful. Yeah. 
Wow, I'm sure a lot of people are going to be looking forward to that, finger for cross, sure. Finger uh, so it sounds really exciting. I mean, look, it, it, when we talk about Fabula Pictures, there's a lot going on, right? But when we broaden the spectrum, as far as the audiovisual industry is concerned, there's a lot happening. It seems like the environment is constantly changing. There's like, you know, new technological advancements. There is cultural changes yeah. in how people consume the content. Yeah. Uh, just in general, how do you feel is this moment in time in audiovisual industry, do you always have to be in guard with whatever is happening now? And do you feel well, positive or negative? I, I, I think negative because what you were saying, I mean, the time of change, uh, new stuff, new technology probably was between 2015 and 2020 before the pandemic. So the pandemic spread instantly in a massively anything we were, uh, we were to, make it happen in 10 years time. So we prepared the 2020 event with uh, new technologies, new way to do dramas, a new, new uh, generation of writers and actors and directors. The pandemic exploded too fast. And so now the rebound effect is coming. So I think what is going to happen is we, we will have a couple of years of, um, Cop shows, probably. Cop shows, <laughs> yeah. thrillers, uh, crime, dramas, yeah, and all of that stuff. There will be few, few innovative examples that probably will bring us to think that will be a bright future. Interesting. So in your opinion, the pandemic period hasn't had an impact on uh, maybe like creativity or ambition or the desire to pursue content that is maybe thinking outside the box a little more? Inflated the number of uh, potential viewable contents. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We have too much content. We have too much uh, inflation of, um, of uh, similar contents. Many platforms collapsed as well and they changed their business model. We are now facing the very quick way to reinterpret the way of uh, making our business. Uh, and this is happening too fast for us. Uh, that That's probably the, the, the biggest problem. The, the impact of sh uh, the proliferation and growing popularity of short form content as well, TikTok. So many people now just watch it. That's all they watch. Yeah, I remember I was in a dinner with Reed Hastings some time ago, some years ago. And then I asked, I spread a question to him. Who's your major competitor at the moment and he said youtube say what the hell youtube youtube is um it's for kids yes of course this is for kids and i see it with my kids no so they are addicted to tutorials or short videos or something you don't feel to have a narrative in it yeah that's these are all things worth considering but nicola one of the things you did at this summit you took part in a panel that highlighted the value of co-productions, right? Are co-productions an answer? So what, what did you discuss during this panel and what is your opinion of the role of co-productions <laughs> in all that we've been kind of we, discussing? We've been, we have been discussing about the power of and, um, and the importance of uh, being able to co-produce, share contents, share point of view, share money, um, share risk. The conclusion is that producers are ready, broadcast a little bit less, because they need to preserve their desire to watch over domestic audience in a way they need to watch over. They are not inclined to do anything progressive because they need to preserve. They need to preserve a larger audiences. Niche is, uh, is to nowadays is seen like uh, something risky. And we made also a big conclusion uh, about language. So language barrier for non-English speakers is still a barrier. So uh, you, you can't talk about organic language uh, until the end of the days, but uh, the reality is that if you want to hit mainstream, you need to go English speaking. Uh, otherwise, you, you will never hit mainstream. So the conclusion is, and I was bringing like, like an, uh, as an example on, on stage, co-production co is like a marriage. So you, you spend a large period of flirting, then you need to set up, you need to say things uh, properly. You need to, you need to do things properly. Uh, bring the garbage outside. So I do, you, you do the dishwasher. You, you take care of the kids. I go work. Uh, that's it. Yeah. It's, it's an intense period of, um, 
coexistence. That's yeah. co-production. And also has a lot to do with trust. Loyal, be loyal, be trustful. It's probably number one rule. So what do you, what do you look for in a trustworthy companion then? <laughs> <laughs> Resources? No, but let's open it up, open it up maybe a little bit. Cause we were talking about international co-productions, let's say. What does, why would somebody from another territory or another country want to co-produce with, with Italy? What do you feel are its strength, strong points, its, its main resources and what it can offer? Budgetary reasons, first of all. I think um, you share your portion of a project because you need to share a portion of the risk. We need co-production because we don't have enough money to do our shows by, uh, by ourselves. But also, and this is more philosophical at the end of the day, but it's very important, a fresh eye from the outside will bring potentials for sales purposes of your show, of your movie. So the more we can have multiple access to your, in the, in building one project, the more you, you're going to have chances to make it watch, make it watchable uh, outside of your own country. Well, Nicola, you have a flight to catch. So I can't keep you too yes. long. This has been fascinating, but I've made it a point. Uh, to ask a very simple question, a sillier question than some of the ones we've asked in this conversation, just because, you know, sometimes these events can be a little stuffy. So I want to kind of just find out a little, (laughs) yeah, a little bit about uh, the people I'm interviewing, but a little more about their personal side. We talk about audiovisual content. We all have guilty pleasures, something that we like to turn on and just watch to unwind, you know? What is your go-to thing? that you watch when you're just stressed or life is becoming too much? Is there some comfort watching that you do? And what is that? And it can be anything. It can be narrative, fiction, sports, just content. Well, being Italian means, means being a football addicted, but um, I'm trying to, since, it, since my squad is not working very well. So What is your team? Lazio. Lazio, oh well, yeah. It's not working. We have a very bad president, by the way. And oh. I hope this podcast will spread the word. Uh, <laughs> Lotito. No. Lotito, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Who's going to manage Lazio next year? That's a question. A guy called Baroni. Oh, Baroni. Yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> so, all right. There's football, but then um, what else? Guilty pleasure, aside of um, spend most of the time, most of the valuable time with kids, with my kids. It's, a, it's, a, it's cr- extremely important. I watch a lot of stuff. So I'm an insomniac. So I don't sleep, basically. And when I sleep, I take pills. And so I watch a, a huge amount of stuff. And sometimes I forget what I watch. <laughs> but um, uh, when you want some guilty pleasure that makes you feel, okay, fantastic. I spent my last um, uh, three months re-watching for probably the fifth or the sixth time Suits. Suits. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about it? It's the world of suits, the world where it takes place, right? It's, uh, it's the way they, they announce the stories in suits. It's uh, fantastic because you, it, it, they grabs you, uh, from the interiors of your guts and puts you on, on, on the sofa and you surrender to it. You surrender to it. Gotcha. And I love it. I love it. And, and that's why we are so much planning to do a legal drama very, very soon for Sky. Right. Really? Yeah. 2025. We we'll, start producing. We'll be watching this space. There's a lot to look forward to when it comes to the Fabula. Yeah. So, well, thank you very much for joining us, Nicola. Thank it's you. Been thank you. Great. Have a great flight. Safe thank, flight. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation from the Audiovisual Producer Summit of 2024 taking place in Reggio Calabria, Italy. And let me take this opportunity to remind you that there's plenty more great podcast conversations with film industry professionals, audiovisual professionals and creatives from all over the world that you can discover over at filmverdictnetwork.com, whether you work in the audiovisual industry or would like to find out more about it. And to make sure you never miss an episode, you can look for us by entering TFV Network and following us wherever you get your podcasts from. Till the next time, from the Film Verdict, this is Matt Makutsi signing off. See you soon.